Good morning, church. How are you? Um, I understand the kids are with us this week in the service. So if just, we'll have the kids just uh, stand by themselves. Just kidding. They can sing, and how they sing will assess what kind of Christmas presents you get next year. So it's a big day for you kids, all right? It's getting written down, documented. You're on camera. I'm going to stop mumbling. Uh, we're going to stand and worship. Um, yeah, if you'll stand with me. Father God, we just invite you into this place. We invite you into our hearts and minds. And um, God, we just give this as our offering. Um, we pray that you feel honored. Uh, we pray that you feel praised. And um, you just soften our hearts to spend time with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah. Out by day is a sign that you are with me. The fire by night is a guiding light to my feet. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Oh. You stepped into my Egypt. You took me by the hand And you marched me out in freedom Into the promised land Now I will not forget you, God I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fury of your love You stepped into my Egypt You took me by the hand You marched me out in freedom Into the promised land now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is night is 
is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hope, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, He will be. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this sin has been defeated and Jesus now and ever is my plea oh the chains are released I can sing I am free yet not I but through Christ in me with every breath to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this may be seated. As you are seated, I'd like to ask you to do your best to stay focused here just in a mindset of worship for a few minutes uh, as we continue our time of praising Him. Um, last week, of course, Christmas Sunday. Uh, there is not a whole lot easier Sunday, Easter Sunday, I guess, uh, to be a pastor. Uh, folks come in excited about worshiping the newborn king and we celebrate and everything like that. This year, it's a little bit, I'm sorry, this week, it's a little bit different. Just from the standpoint of, uh, I don't know about anybody else, I was taking down Christmas decorations yesterday. The poinsettias are starting to wilt a little bit. And uh, different things come to an end. And uh, 13 hours from now, roughly, we start a new year. I'll be sound asleep, I, I really hope, but, uh, but some of you will be, will be up you know, celebrating that, that coming in. But I really think this morning we want to take some time and make sure that we are focused, we're oriented uh, during a time of worship that we really need just to focus on Him this morning. Um, who knows what 24 holds, right? Uh, Francis was going through the 23 calendar and going, wow, <laughs> what a year. Uh, but who knows where 24 goes? We, we, have, we have no clue. We know it's an election year. Oh. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we, we know different things like, like that. And we can look at it and we can look at it with some dread. But here's how I want us to look for a few minutes thinking about 24. I want you to pray along with me. Uh, not Psalm 24, but Psalm 23. As I mention it, I think it'll be familiar to many of you. We're, we're familiar with the 23rd song. But in your hearts, if you could take a few mu minutes and think about the words of the 23rd Psalm and maybe pray some things through this to the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. We just sang about that. I shall not want. God, 
<laughs> because I have you, I have everything I need. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. God, I need your peace. <laughs> so thankful for that. God, I want to allow you to lead me into that place of trust in you and into that peace. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. As I look at 24, there might be some decisions. I don't know what's ahead, but I know God knows what's ahead. I know that he will lead me. I know I don't have to navigate this world on my own. He's there with me. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Even though I know there will be difficult times, I know there will be tough times, I know that God is with me, Lord, and I want to I lean on that. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Okay, think about that for a minute. My cup runneth over. You prepare a table before me. In other words, there's going to be places where, yes, there's opposition, but I can still feast, if you will. I can still feast on you, Jesus, and I can still love you, and I can still uh, grow in you, and I can still have a great year, even though, yes, there's going to be times when I'm seated there with my enemies. I get that. And what's it say at the end? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hey, we know where this thing ends, right? How great it is to meditate and to cling to the truths of God. And we need to do that this morning, okay? Don't let, listen, a few years ago, a, a friend started sending me TED Talks. Do you, you know what TED Talks, you know, a little inspirational and educational speeches? And some of them were really good. I really liked them. I, I was enjoying the ones he was sending me. They got some weird ones too, but, uh, but he sent me some really good ones. I loved it. I love them, and they're beneficial. Don't let this be a TED Talk, okay? Don't let this be a show. Why are we here today? We're going to worship the King. The first few words of our sermon this week of our text are that we are to walk in the Spirit. And the next two songs we're going to sing, we're going to talk some about the Holy Spirit, inviting Him in that. And we want to get a hold of exactly what that means to walk in the Spirit. So would you stand with me again? And Father, <laughs> we love you, Jesus. And I, I know how our lives go. I know how my life goes. And I, sometimes I run even into prayer and don't even think about what I'm doing. I just start saying some words. Lord, don't let this time be like that. Lord, we have an hour here. We, we need to reorient our minds to you, Lord. We need to worship you. We need to spend some time loving you. We need to spend some time in your arms as you love us. So, Lord, would you draw us close during this hour? Would you... Uh, Make obvious your working in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm coming with a heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. Ready for a miracle, hearts praying for a fresh encounter, souls looking to the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Oh, Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. Holy Spirit, fall in this place, fill our hearts. Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, come. We're on the edge of a new beginning, God, we know you have so much more, we're looking to a new horizon, we're praying for your rain. For an overflowing of true redemption, an overflowing of your kingdom. We're ready for a real revival. Oh, Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. Holy Spirit, fall in this place, fill our hearts. Holy Spirit, come like a flood. Like a fire, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, come. 
again.
So we are going to take two more weeks here and finish up the book of Galatians. You may remember back long before Christmas came, we were working our way through Galatians, didn't quite finish. We're going to do the end of chapter 5 today, chapter 6 next week, um, as we've just taken a three-week break. So we need to review a second, okay? Remember the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul, who's known really as a missionary to the Gentiles, had traveled around throughout uh, Asia Minor, throughout what is today Turkey, and he preached the gospel. He told people very clearly that Jesus Christ had died for their sins and that he had completely paid the price and that they needed to repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ and that Jesus would give them new life. And they were excited. They were pumped. They got, they got that message. But then some of the folks from the church in Jerusalem decided that they needed to add a little bit to what Paul was saying. And they came around and they traveled around and they said, wait, 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 wait. Gentiles, you can't get saved unless you also become Jews. you got to keep the law. And, uh, and in the book of Galatians, we pick up a passionate tone from the Apostle Paul because he didn't want anything added to the gospel because here's what happens. Anytime you add anything to the gospel, you've changed the gospel. It's a different gospel. It's not true because the gospel is Jesus and Jesus alone. Okay? So Paul is passionate about this, and, he, and we found his passion. We saw some things he said personally, and we saw some teaching that he gave doctrinally. He focused on the idea that it is about faith, it is not about works, and that now we are free, free from the law. God has set us free. We're not supposed to use that freedom as an excuse to uh, act out the flesh, but we're to, in love, serve one another. But he said you're free. The emphasis is on grace, not works grace. We don't earn our salvation. You don't add anything to it. It is a gift of God through grace. Okay, now, what we got to look at, we said at the beginning, we said the, the book of Galatians kind of divided into three sections. You got your personal section, you got your doctrinal section, and you got your practical session. Now, we're moving into the practical session section, okay? Here's how you're supposed to live. What then shall I do? How then shall I live? Because all these things are true, uh, is the question. And, uh, and he begins to dig in there, and what he does is he gives us a flat-out list of everything that, you, that we need to do in Jesus. He said, number one, go, no, that's not in there at all. He hits it totally differently. So let's see how he hits it. I was going to press this and see if the slide would change. It will not. Uh, but if I press the right thing, there we go, beautiful thing. So here's our first verse. He started off, and he said, here's what I'm saying. Walk in the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This right here is called magic moves, okay? Uh, Marissa loaned us one of these. This is actually mine. I bought this this week. But, uh, but loaned us one of these so we could take it and play with our grandchildren. And last uh, Monday, we had a dance-off. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Visual, visualize that for a minute here. Uh, Francis and I and the two grandchildren had a dance off. We appointed dad as the judge of who won every dance. The way this works is I got to turn it on for a second. Work it out. Can you hear that? Shake it up. Work it out. Magic moves all about. But then what it is, it gives you, it gives shh, shh. Okay. We will. We will. I can't shut her up when I want to, but, uh, but she, uh, but what it does is it gives you different instructions, okay? For example, are you ready for the first one? Prowl like a tiger. Prowl like a tiger, okay? And then you are to float like a butterfly. And, uh, and it plays music for a while, and we would compete. Uh, I ha No, we're not doing that right now. Uh, but uh, I, I should mention I won the Grow Like a Plant you want to, you want to see how I grew like a plant? It was a, it was a beautiful thing. Uh, Francis, Francis won the walk like a rhino. She wasn't real glad that she was awarded that prize. Uh, actually, I think my son-in-law did that to be spiteful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll give that to Gigi. Uh, she walked like a rhino. But, uh, but we played that that game for a while. We had a good time. But you know, it, it was, you know, again, float like a butterfly. Yeah, and, and we were to float like a cloud and different things like that. I say that because I got thinking about this phrase, walk in the Spirit. What's that mean? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Walk in the Spirit. Well, how do you do that? Uh, let's have a contest. You know, does that mean I kind of float around a little bit? Exactly what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? We get a little afraid of this idea 
and even spect, uh, skeptical of this idea because we think, okay, well, that, what does that mean, follow your conscience? But it doesn't. See, the conscience is different. We're all born with a conscience, but we don't get the spirit until we are born again. And the conscience, the Bible says this, can be seared, and it can change, and it can be weak. You find all those adjectives descri describing a conscience in the Bible. But the Spirit of God never changes. And the other reason why people are afraid of the whole idea of walking in the Spirit is that if you have been around church world for very long, you know that the Spirit of God gets blamed on all types of weird behavior. Well, I just feel led by God. <laughs> and they do all that. And sometimes even wicked behavior uh, led by God. And that's never right because the Spirit of God will never lead us contrary to the Word of God. He just never will. Uh, but uh, so we get a little bit afraid of this idea. You know, well, what do we talk? Is this kind of a weird thing? What, what is this? What, what you talking about? Uh, you know, with this whole idea of walking in the Spirit. So we're going to dig into that a little bit as we continue through our passage. And first of all, he tells us this. He says, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the flesh are against, I'm sorry, the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. What he tells us, first of all, is there is going to be a battle in our lives. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, we're also going to have to deal with the flesh. That's just very simply, that's where we are. We looked at that back in Galatians 2.20, where it says that with the life we now live in the flesh, we live by faith. And we have that going on. In other words, we are going to continue to struggle sometimes, uh, maybe more often than not in some cases, we're going to struggle with the flesh. We still have these fleshly desires. That is a battle going on over in Romans chapter 8, verse number 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. To set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So, God, I want to set my mind on the spirit, and I want to live, and I want to walk in the spirit. Now, before we leave verse number 17, I want to highlight one other thing there. It says that this battle sometimes keeps you from doing the things that you, what's the last three words? You want to do. Those are very important words that, that we mention. And it is that idea is, I do have this new life in Jesus Christ, and I want to do what's right. Sometimes people will say to me, Pastor, I hate, I keep doing what I don't want to do. Sometimes I wonder if I'm even in a, a Christian, you say I have this new life of God in me. And uh, I keep doing the things I don't want to do. And I'll say this, the fact that you don't want to do those things is a very, very, very good sign, okay, because we have this new life. We're still going to struggle with the flesh. But the fact that I can't be comfortable in that, I don't want to do that, I desire to do other things, uh, is a great sign of the new life that Christ is in me because now I want to do what's right. I was asked one time, actually by a counselor, he said, why do you keep doing that? I said, oh, no, I guess I want to. He said, do you really? He said, well, no, I don't want to behave like that. And, uh, and, he said, and he said, well, that's the truth. You want to do what's right. Now, you need to ask God for his power and his strength, and you want to learn to walk in the, in the spirit rather than walking in the flesh. That's where we want to get to. But it is a good news that you want to do what is right, verse number 18 and 19. But, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh, those things that are, that are in us there are evident. Okay, now uh, let's go ahead and look at the list, but I want you to remember that he says these things are evident. He says these things are obviously the works of the flesh, okay? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, just obsession there, idolatry, putting things ahead of God. Sorcery has its root in the word pharmaceuticals. Uh, you can figure out that one. Enmity, strife. Someone says strife today. We don't talk about strife. Put the word drama in there. People love drama. Uh, drama, drama. Uh, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I have warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me come back to that for a second. But let me just remember, God says, hey, these things are evident. I was asking A.J. this morning, I said, do, do policemen, when they pull you over, still say to you, do you know why I pulled you over? <laughs> has there ever been a question that has received more lot, uh, dishonest answers? <laughs> do you know why I pulled you over? No. Uh, no clue. Didn't know I was going 90. Honestly. Uh, but, um, you know, so somebody's going to lie every time with that one. But uh, truth of the matter is we, you, we know most all the time when we're doing something that's wrong. We just do. 
He said, these things are evident. It's obvious when you're walking in the flesh. This, this is just plain. And, he, you know, he goes on. He says, those that do these things, here's the idea. Again, we've talked about we have this battle between the flesh and the spirit. And there will be times when we stumble into living in the flesh. I heard one pastor use this expression this week I'd never heard before. He said, ah, I guess I fleshed out on that one. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> kind, of, kind of interesting. That's not use this excuse, but you know, when you misbehave, well, I guess I fleshed out on that one. Uh, but I walked in the flesh on that one, and there will be times when we do that. But when we dwell on that in there, when we stay in there, when we're comfortable in there, living in those things, that's a pretty good evidence that we haven't, uh, we're not part of the kingdom of God. We're not his child. Okay, we might stumble into it, but we're not going to live there. We're not going to stay there. It is obvious these things have nothing to do with God. Now, let's go on. But the fruit of the Spirit is, some of you might know this list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Um, I mentioned a couple weeks ago the, the teens having a session one night where they were asking questions. And they honestly, they ask great questions. We, lo- we love that time together with them. Uh, but one of the questions that I, I don't like, and, and if, it's, if this is your question, please, I'm not picking on you because everybody asks this type of question. But one question that came in that, that was on my little list to answer, and I can't remember what it was, but they said, is, is this a sin? Is such and such a sin? We always ask that question, is this a sin, Pastor? Do you think this is a sin? I always want to say, wrong question. Okay? This, when we walk in the Spirit, when we seek to follow Him and His Word, we're not all right, is this a sin, is this not a sin? Honestly, we know. We know what is the right way to go. So there's no way that you can, and, and here's one of the main ideas of Galatians. You can't legislate Christianity down to every little detail. You can't come up with enough, enough rules. There's 600 some commandments in the Bible. That's not enough. Okay, we can't live like that. So we are to walk in the spirit. Get it on the inside. There's no way we're going to memorize all 600 rules, and again, that's not enough. Have you ever been in a situation, maybe it's a workplace, maybe it's a school or something like that, where they made a rule for everything, every situation? Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, we need, uh, you, you come up with the stupidest rules. Uh, you know, well, nobody then can do it. They never talk to the individual and deal with the root of the problem. They just make another rule. That's why sometimes these institutions and workplaces, everything like that, have these massive rule books because they don't deal with any individuals. They don't deal with the root of the problem. They just keep adding rules on. That's what we would have as far as Christianity goes if it was about keeping the laws. We would just have rule after rule after rule after rule. It's this is this not this But that's not what it's about. It's about a new life that God gives me, and now I'm commanded to walk in the Spirit. Wait a minute. we got to highlight a word up there. That must mean we need to stop and talk about that for a minute. But the... Okay, now I want to go back a couple slides. Uh, in, right in the middle there, above evident, it says, now the what? Works. Okay, now the works of the flesh. But when it gets to the spirit, it says, now the? Okay, very, cr- okay, you get nothing else, folks. <laughs> Listen for the next few minutes. This is so crucial that we get this. When you t- start listing these wonderful fruits of the spirit, these things that we'd want to have as part of our lives, the love, joy, peace, patience, all these things, it would be fitting if I were to preach a series of sermons, eight weeks long, take one a week and go through and say, hey, here's what joy looks like, and here's how we can develop joy. Uh, here's what kindness looks like, and here's how we can develop. What I'm saying is these are things that you can work on developing. However, that's not what the Bible says they really are. What they are is fruit. Okay, so what they come from then is this new life that I have in Christ. So I I want you to think about the words of Christ in John chapter 15. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he says this very plainly. Listen, if you can kind of imagine Jesus saying this, without me, you can do nothing. You need me and you need to be tied in me. Let let me show you a verse here in uh, that you may be familiar with. It's from the very first of the Psalms. And it says this talking about the the man walking after God uh, that is the good man. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Okay, it's like he's living there, in there with his roots down. We we looked at a prayer a few weeks ago uh, in Ephesians where Paul prayed, uh, and he says, I pray that you'll get your roots down deep, that you'll dig into who Jesus is, and that you'll really know him, you'll understand his love. That's the Christian life. 
Okay, I've said this before. If the Christian life is limited to a bunch of rules, I don't want anything to do with it, and it's not going to help us. Throw it out. The Christian life is about understanding that God gives us his spirit and living this life and learning to walk more and more controlled by him. Now, let me say again. We got this battle going on, right? He told us that very plainly. We still have the flesh. We still have the spirit. But more and more, we grow into an understanding of what this looks like. I get my roots down in Jesus. Um, yeah, let me do. When, uh, when I was in uh, junior Junior high, I don't know where I was. I was in school. I was in high school. Yeah, I was in high school. I went to this real little dinky little school my last year. I've told you about it before. I was the only graduate, valedictorian, all that. My same jokes I use all, all the time. Uh, but uh, but we, it was an interesting little place. We had about 40 kids. Uh, I sat beside a fourth grader. <laughs> we all worked at our own little thing, kind of uh, like that. I could beat him up, too. But anyway, the uh, but we had a teacher. His name was Ralph Anderson. And it was, it was kind of a hilarious little setup because a bunch of little white kids, and Ralph Anderson was a six foot six, probably 300 pound black guy. And he was great. I, I, I still remember him. In fact, I still remember the sermon that he preached. I remember him standing up one day and saying, folks, you need to get a grip on the word of God. He said, you need to have a five finger grip on the word of God. And he said, one of those fingers is uh, that you hear it preached and then you read it and then you study it and then you meditate it on it and then you memorize it. And he said, get those five things and get a grip on the Word of God. Okay, so he's standing there with the little kids, and he'd walk around, and he'd say, okay, let's say you get a grip on the Word of God with just two fingers. Would you do me a favor for a second? See if you can pull that out of my hand. Yep. Pull hard. Pull hard. You got it, okay? Let's say I get three fingers on it. Three fingers, okay? Three fingers, pull. Okay, not that great a grip. Let's say I get four. I can still see Ralph doing this. Uh, I got four fingers on it, and, and see if you could just take it. Go ahead and tell you. I got four, fi four fingers. No, no, poor. You almost had it. You got it. All right, there you go. And then he said, now, I'm not going to do this one because my grip strength isn't very big, and it's going to be embarrassing if I lose it. But Ralph would grab this thing with all five fingers. <laughs> Little kid. I got it. Uh, but Ralph would grab this thing, and he'd hold it, and he could get a kid hanging on that and swing him around. Uh, you know, like, look at that. You can't get that out of my hand. I got this incredible grip on the Word of God with all five fingers. Now, my life, uh, reading the Bible, I've done, you know, I've read the Bible most of my life. I have had to a lot of cases. I have that advantage of my job. Uh, I make sure it's studying it. For sure, I have that advantage that I'm required to do that. Hearing it, honestly, I, I, this is not bragging. This is where my life has gone. I've heard so many sermons. I mean, I went to, you know, three years of Christian day school and five years of Bible college, and they preached to chapel every, stink I mean, every single day, not stinking day. Uh, and, you know, I've heard so many sermons. I've heard it preached. I've read it. I've even, and though I cannot do this very well at, at my current age, I've even memorized quite a bit of it. One thing that I've always kind of shied away from, you know which one I'm missing in there? Meditate. Because it seemed creepy to me. You know, and none of that, when my hip was messed up, I couldn't sit like that, you know. Ooh, uh, Dale, uh, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. But it all, I always had that weird idea, you know, what, what is meditation? That is just kind of creepy in this idea of digging deep into the Word of God and meditating and getting to a higher place. It creeped me out a little bit. Okay, I want to do everything that I can today, today to say, Let's, let's lose that. Let's lose that fear of going deep into the Word of God. We want to dwell, get our roots down in Him that we can have this life. Okay, we want to dig deep. We want to understand that He is the vine. We are the branches. We have to be connected to Him, folks. Okay, and we want to dig into that. What we did earlier in the service was Psalm 23. That's meditation. Remember that? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want Dear God, if I have you, I have everything I need. You prepare, I'm jumping, but you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. God, I know there will be difficult times ahead, but even in that, I'm going to feast, Lord. And that's what I want for this year. That's what I want for my life. Even in the, in the midst of difficulty, I still want to feast on you. I don't want to know you, and I want to love you. Okay, that, that's where I want to have. But if we, <laughs> I'll get it. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I, I break up the whole meditation theme there for a second. But I, I realize when I say that, that uh, honestly, I, I know that. Like I said, I'm a little bit, I remember, you know, the, there was a thing way back. Some of you have to be as old as I am to remember this, the deeper life movement. And uh, it got weird. It really did, you know. So I remember thinking, oh, the deeper life, that's just strange, that's weird, and everything like that. But if there's one great passion that God has laid upon my heart as far as shepherding this congregation and the people who hear me preach, I want to shepherd you in the direction of learning to dwell deep in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, and you know how that ties into what we do here today. I, like I said, I don't want it to be a TED talk. I don't want to come in so I can share a little tidbit with you. I want you to come and really worship the King of Kings and spend time with Him and draw on His strength. I, man, that's what we got to do, folks. We're in a battle. We really are. We need that strength. We need to dwell uh, on Him. Let me go ahead back to our text in uh, in Galatians. He says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh and the desires with it, passions, uh, the passions and desires with it. You might remember again, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. In uh, Romans again, it says, so you also must consider yourselves to be what? Dead to sin, alive to God in Jesus Christ. We are buried with him. Okay, well, what is this talking about, this idea of I am crucified or I am dead or anything like that? I want you to remember again this word back in Galatians 2.20 and any time that it talks about us being crucified, it's in what they call the progressive tense in Greek, but it is that idea that this is a continuing process, that daily I want to lay down and surrender. And, and I want us to, to really work to develop habits like this. I get up in the morning and I say, God, I really need you today. Here's some things going on in my day. Can't do it without you. I need you. Okay. I, and and I'm, not, I'm not preaching now. I'm just talking, honestly, is that where we are? I don't think we are. We're so busy with life. I mean, I've come in here on Sunday mornings to preach the, the gospel, and I, it's kind of like I'm standing over there, and I realize I've been running around for four hours. I never stopped and said, God, I can't do this without you. And that's how we live our lives a lot of times. We're trying to raise kids, uh, have marriages to thrive and survive. Uh, we're trying to share the gospel with uh, other people, and we're trying to do it all in the energy of the flesh. And God says, that's not how I designed this to be. I want you to learn to dwell in me. I want you to ask me to help you lie down beside still waters or, or in the green pasture and besides still waters and get your roots down. And I want you to flourish like that. This is the life I want for you. And it's going to be a daily process of saying, God, I want this old flesh crucified. I want it to die, and I want to, to live in you. The last verse in chapter 5 of Galatians, I almost left out of this sermon because I, when I first read it, I thought, I wonder if they got this in the wrong chapter. You, you know that uh, divisions aren't inspired. I thought, yeah, maybe that this belongs in chapter 6. When I first read it, I thought it did. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm not on the last verse, yes. But if we live by the Spirit, let us, there's, there's a cool phrase right there, isn't it? Let's keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, think about what that would mean. It's not creepy. It means I get up and I say, Lord, I want to follow you today. And, and listen, listen, we're normal. We're going to have to reorient, learn to reorient ourselves to that over and over again throughout the day. It's not like you're going to have one minute like that in the morning and then 10 minutes later you're not going to forget about it. But as we grow in this, as we mature in this, it becomes more and more our second nature. And that flesh is more and more dead and that spirit life in us is more and more alive. It takes some time. It is a process. But we want to get into that and we want to learn more and more step by step. Follow Jesus. Why not? Isn't that awesome? You know, just to think about, hey, this is where we want to be more and more growing in this in 2024. And this is the verse I said I wasn't sure even belonged in there. He says, let us not prov uh, become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. And I thought, okay, how does that exactly fit in? But, you know, here, here, here's the thing I thought was awesome. I, I looked at it, and in the Greek it does fit in. It's part of the same paragraph. He's, he's talking about the same thing. And he says, okay, with all this, don't become conceited. Uh, it's all about uh, one another. Okay, you don't want to be doing these things to one another. It's all about kind of this life we're in together. Don't become conceited, provoking other people and everything like that. And I thought how wonderful this is because one of the things it totally takes out of the picture is comparison. 
And I love that. My relationship to Jesus Christ is separate from everybody else's, and I'm not in a contest, okay? Some of you I could beat. <laughs> Some of you I'd get killed, and that's okay. But I want to be growing and walking and, and following him. Uh, and, yes, hey, there's some of us have, a, have a patterns in our flesh that are ingrained in us, and, they're gonna, and it's going to take a while. We're going we're gonna to go back to some of those patterns like that. You're not going to you know, pray a prayer in church and, whoo, uh, now I'll never sin again. Okay? James says if we say we're not without sin, we're liars. Uh, you know, like that. So let's, let's realize that But what God is calling you, and put yourself in there, would you? See yourself in there. God is calling me to a closeness and a walk with him. And that's what I want. That's what I want. Well, is this a sin or not a sin? Don't, honestly, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You don't have to worry about it. What I want to worry about close that those other things work themselves out as I begin to follow him and his spirit and his truth and his word. And that's how the Christian life is designed to work, that I walk in the spirit. So the apostle Paul says, okay, you need to understand this. This new life, it's not about works. It's about faith. Well, what's that look like, Paul? Well, how then shall I live? Here's what you do. You walk in the spirit step by step. Now understand, hey, you still got this flesh. And there's going to be times when you think, oh, I'm doing things I don't want to be doing again. I get that. But God has given you this new life and this new spirit. And I want to make sure that the way I'm living is flowing out of the, listen, hopefully this doesn't sound weird. The way I'm living is flowing out of the roots that I have in my relationship to Jesus Christ. It's not about works. It's about fruit coming out because I am dwelling personally in him. Now, as I said, <laughs> Very, very, very passionate about this, folks. I don't want us to go through the motions in anything we do here. Um, and um, I, we deliberately wanted to have communion today while the kids were in here uh, for an opportunity for them to witness communion and just, just be aware of that. The decision on partaking is a parental decision. So uh, I want you to know, know that if, if they're going to take the elements. But, uh, but folks, and this is what I said before, I, I don't want to get weird with communion, you know, ooh, you know, uh, let's, uh, let's all, you know, again, walk in the spirit, what's that mean? Uh, like that. But I so much want this to be an opportunity to worship him, okay? I hope somewhere in this whole process, as you look at a cracker that represents a, a, a Savior's body that was broken for you, I hope somewhere <laughs> you don't do that. Uh, and I hope that somewhere you, you stop and you say, Jesus, I love you. I love you. I can't believe you did this for me. I can't believe that God came down to earth <laughs> was it? in human flesh. That's what this represents. I can't believe that. I cannot believe it, God, you love me that much. I hope that somewhere over the next few minutes you can look at the cup and say, and you died for me, Lord. I can't believe that. I love you, Jesus. I love you so much for that. So what we're going to do in a second, um, I'm going to set this up here so that uh, we can form a couple of lines coming up here and picking up the elements. We have a cup um, to represent the blood of Christ. And we have a cracker to represent, represent the body of Christ. And we'll all take those together in a few minutes. So you can just pick them up and return to your seat. But folks, didn't come to say we went to church today. Okay? We came to worship. Let us do that uh, even as we take communion and as we get ready to close on this day. Father, yeah, I'm, not, I'm just going to pray that, Lord. I, I love you. I know I'm surrounded by people who love you. We know you. We want to live for you. Um, we want to get this idea of walking in the Spirit and, and learn to do that, walk with you each day. We, we, we want to know what that's like to be living by the, by the water, planet, a tree that's planted there and has the roots down deep and just flourishing because we know you. And, Lord, I pray that this would be uh, what you would impress upon our hearts this day. And, Father, now, now we look to the only way that we can know you, the only way that we can know eternal life is because Christ paid the price for our sins. 
We love you, Jesus, for that too. Amen. So Dan asked if I would kind of lead this portion of, of communion today. And, um, yeah, I really I had this plan of following up Dan and what I wanted to do and then just listening to Dan and, and kind of thinking about what we're doing here. Um, the, the whole communion is designed to help us remember, uh, to remember what Jesus did for us. And so that's exactly what I want to do. I want to I wanna read through... Uh, the account of Jesus's crucifixion here in Mark, uh, and remember what he did for us before we we partake. Um, so it says the soldiers took him away and into a place, and they called together the whole Roman cohort, and they dressed him in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to acclaim, "Hail the King of the Jews!" They kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him, and kneeling and bowing before him, and they mocked him. And they took the purple robe off him and put on garments on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they pressed into service a passerby coming from the county, Simon of Cyrene, to bear his cross. Then they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means the skull. They uh, They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. 
And it was in the third hour that they crucified him, the inscription that was charged against him, the king of the Jews. The story doesn't stop there, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a little bit ahead here and, and kind of get to the, the awesome Jesus conquering death part. Here towards the, the end of the book of Mark, the Mary, and, uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, went to the tomb, and the, the stone was rolled away. And when they walked in, they saw a young man, and he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene. He has been crucified, yet he is risen, and he is not here. Behold, he is, in a place, he is not in the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples, Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he has told you. The story doesn't end with the crucifixion. This is a reminder of the suffering that Christ went for us so that he could raise from the dead, showing us that he conquered death for us. And so when he says in in Luke that we're to do this in remembrance, and as I kind of read through that today, that's what we're remembering. We're remembering a Savior who willingly went to the cross for us. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took, uh, got these backwards. I had this outlined, and I should have read it ahead of time. But he took the cup. Um, and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the bread also, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm just going to pray, and then I have a few announcements before we're dismissed today. God, thank you for sending your son. Thank you that he lived a perfect life that we could never do so that he could be a perfect sacrifice for us and and all so that we could have a restored relationship with you. Um, I thank you for that. I pray that today as we're taking these elements that you remove me as a distraction um, and that we are able to truly remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Um, Yeah, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, A few announcements here before before I dismiss you. The first one, our kids' wing will be opening up. I I had the little joke of next year, you know, but it's actually just next week. Uh, But next week we'll be back to to full-on kids' ministry. Um, So the kids that are in here this week, you guys will be able to, to head down the hallway next week. The Pancake and Parenting is coming up on January 13th. This is an opportunity where uh, Dan and um, Jim Miskevich will be uh, teaching on parenting, and we would love for all of you to come and attend and learn uh, what, the, what the scriptures have to say about parenting. Um, but we would like you to sign up so we know how much child care is needed for that. And then... Uh, we have a prayer and praise night. I'm actually really excited about this. This is something that's coming up next week uh, in the evening at 6 o'clock. Uh, David and Adam and some of our other worship team will be up there leading some songs for us. But this is an opportunity for us to kind of kick off the year in a mindset that focuses us on God. Um, we're going to sing some songs. We're going to spend some time praying in smaller groups and in larger groups um, and really just try to kick off our year with a focus that is on our Savior uh, and singing and worshiping Him uh, next evening or next Sunday evening. Uh, there is a women's book club that's going to be starting up here in the month of January. They're going to be reading a book called Find Your People. And uh, they have a couple of meetings one's on the last day of January and one's on the last day of February. Um, if that's something you're interested in, please see Stephanie Graham. She would love to give you more information about it, but you will need to start reading soon. So you need to get a hold of that book quickly so that you can read the first half here before the end of January and then the second half through February. Uh, finally, if you would like to support what God's doing here, you can do that financially uh, through a couple of boxes that are located at both entrances or online through the Church Center app. Let me pray, and we'll, we'll go forward for the rest of our day. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your people here at Community. I pray 
that as we go out from here, we live uh, in the way that Dan talked about today, that we're poor in spirit, uh, seeking uh, a deep relationship with you that, that bears fruit of your spirit in our lives. I pray this in your name. Amen. You're dismissed.